Good morning and thank you for joining us. Um, my name is Carolyn Davies and I'm coordinator here at the Center for Bee Ecology, Evolution and Conservation at York University. And I'd like to welcome you all for joining us for this presentation. So today we are uh, having our fifth edition for the uh, Bee Biogeography and Systematics talks. And uh, this is actually uh, being presented by, oops, here we go. Uh, this is being presented by uh, the Packer Lab at U York University, as well as the Center for Bee Ecology, Evolution and Conservation at York University. We will be having um, a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. Uh, in order to ask your questions to our presenter, uh, we ask that you please use that Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, rather than putting your questions in the chat. We certainly do welcome um, all your uh, notes and chats uh, in that chat feature, but if you have a question for Katie, please make sure that you put it in the Q&A feature, so that way it doesn't get lost in amongst all the other sort of chats and everything. I also understand that not everyone will be able to join us past that sort of hour mark for the, um, the sometimes really extended and exciting uh, Q&A period. I just wanted to let everyone know that we are recording this talk and we will be putting it up on our YouTube channel, uh, hopefully later on today, depending on uh, if the technology is working for me today. So please be sure that if you need to leave for any other appointment or meeting, um, that you can catch the rest of the presentation um, on our YouTube channel. We recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many First Nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, and the Métis. It is now home to many Indigenous peoples. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. Joining us today, uh, people are coming from 22 plus uh, countries across the planet, and we're excited to join everybody together today virtually. Uh, we'd like you to please check out uh, www.native-land.ca. Um, it's certainly, it's, this is a project that started in Canada, but it certainly has a global presence now, and you could probably find out a little bit more about the lands on which you are right now. So without further ado, um, I'd like to welcome you all and welcome Dr. Lawrence Packard, Distinguished Research Professor at York University, uh, to host this presentation. Hello, thank you for that, Caroline. I'm trying to find, uh, where's my, okay, there. Um, how can I, I'm trying to get, well, you don't need to see me. Um, I can, however, say what I want to say, and that is uh, I am thoroughly recovered from the COVID that caused me trouble last month, and I apologize to those of you that sent me uh, uh, that sent me condolences, and I didn't get around to replying to most of you, for which I apologize. But um, it seemed to work quite well last time, having somebody else deal with the questions at the end of the talk. And so we're going to follow the, that strategy again today. And uh, Professor Amro Zayed is going to be dealing with the Q&A at the end uh, for two reasons. One, he likes honeybees more than I do, and uh, he's also Katie's uh, supervisor. So uh, let me introduce the speaker and then we can get on with the serious stuff. So uh, Katie Dogansis is a PhD candidate at York University in Amro Zayed's lab. This is after having done a master's thesis on polistes. Um, so she's turned the subject from vespid social wasps to the domesticated Western honeybee, or is it the Western domesticated honeybee? Uh, research focuses on Apis mellifera evolution and the adaptation of the species throughout its native range. Kathleen's research also focuses on the identification of Africanized honeybees and assessing patterns of admixture in managed Canadian honeybees. So with no further ado, I'll pass us all over to Kathleen. Thank you for coming and uh, I hope you have a good seminar. Hey everyone. It's nice to see you all here today. I'm just gonna get my talk up. There we go. 
All right. Okay, so thank you everyone for having me here today. And thank you for inviting me to give this talk. Um, so today I'm gonna to be talking to you about the evolution and the adaptive radiation um, of the Western honeybee. And today's talk is based off um, my recent publication that was just published in December titled Thrice Out of Asia and the Adaptive Radiation of the Western Honeybee. And this paper is sort of split into two parts. So the first part looking at the phylogeny and the biogeographic reconstruction of the species. And then the second half looking at the adaptive radiation of the species. And that's the format of this talk today. So maybe to some people's dismay, um, I think, you know, the Western honeybee or the honeybee in general is probably one of the most recognized um, subspecies or, sub, or species worldwide. Um, and it's been translocated worldwide for mainly apiculture, um, including honey production and in some cases pollination of crops. But I think what's also really interesting is that it's kind of seeped into our pulp culture where if you're familiar with Honey Nut Cheerios or maybe even the bee movie, we have this really um, kind of familiarity with um, the honeybee. But I think what maybe is less known is that the honeybee is composed of 12 different um, species within the genus Apis. <clears throat> and for the most part, all extant species within this genus are found within Asia, uh, with the exception of Apis mellifera, or the Western honeybee, um, which is located throughout Europe, Africa, and parts of Western Asia. And this is gonna be the focus of our talk today, this species um, located outside of Asia. So because of the large geographic distribution this species occupies, it's um, diversified into about 30 different or so subspecies. And if we take a closer look at these subspecies based on a morphological level, so this is some work from uh, Rutner uh, quite a long time ago, but it looks at how these species essentially, or subspecies group together based on um, approximately 33 different morphological features. And we have 24 different subspecies here, and we can see that each of these subspecies clusters into their own very distinct group. But what's even more interesting is that they cluster kind of broadly into these broader groups. So if we look down here, we can see Apis mellifera, mellifera, and Apis mellifera iberiensis, which are both located in uh, Western Europe, sort of clustering together down here. Um, over here, we see Yemenitica and Lamarckii, which are located in North Africa and in the, and West Asia clustering together. Uh, we see a big cluster of subspecies here, all located in Africa. And then up here, we can see Lagustica and Carnica and some other species in, uh, or subspecies in Eastern uh, Europe and um, uh, Northwest Asia all clustering together. So these species are discernible based on um, very distinct morphological characteristics. If we take more of a molecular look and look at the uh, genetic differences, if we start with mitochondrial variation, which is the genome inherited from the queen. So each of the workers or, uh, in the colony would all have this same uh, mitochondrial variation. But we can see that based on these sequence differences, we can identify individual groups and then again, see that they cluster into these broad categories. <clears throat> So in Africa, we see this sort of dark gray color um, indi indicative of what we call the A haplotype, um, this checkered pattern in Western Europe, um, indicative of the M haplotype, um, this dotted patterning, which corresponds to the C haplotype. And then in North Africa and in Western Asia, we see um, the O haplotype. So each of these groups are distinguishable based on genetic differences, but also again, clustering into these broader groups. And then finally, based on nuclear variation, so this would be genetic variation inherited from both the queen and the drone she's mated with. In this graph here, we're seeing how individuals, which are indicated by these um, circles, sort of cluster together again into very broad groups. So Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Africa, and then two groups in Western Asia. <clears throat> so taken together, since we could kind of categorize subspecies by um, morphology as well as genetics, but more interestingly that they cluster into these broad groups, we've sort of named these distinct lineages based on their geographic 
um, distribution as well as based on the species that cluster or subspecies that cluster with them. So there's the M lineage found in Western Europe, um, the C lineage found in Eastern Europe, the O and the Y lineage found in Western Asia, and then the A lineage found in Africa. And based on these differences, um, these sort of interesting questions arrive about, you know, how these groups kind of got there, where did they come from, and maybe how they've adapted to such a large geographic range. And that's really our questions of interest in this paper and for this talk today, is trying to answer these two questions. So the first being, where did the honeybee come from, and how did it get to its current distribution, or how or what are the current um, colonization routes it may have taken to get to its current distribution? Um, sorry, I was just checking the chat to make sure everything was okay because I see there's a lot of activity. Um, and then secondly, what are the genetic changes that have occurred that have allowed the species to occupy such geographically diverse space? Okay, so for our first question, where did the honeybee come from? Um, this is a question that's, I think, plagued the Apis mellifera community for quite some time. And here, you know, these are just a few papers that have tried to kind of get at this question about where did they come from? And these, these, these questions have been approached using both morphology and genetics. But I think I'm going to talk about a few of the more recent molecular studies to kind of give you some background as to why this question has been plaguing us for so long. So in 2006, Whitfield and all came out with this paper and it was the first sort of large scale molecular approach trying to answer this question of where the honeybee come from. And these 1100 SNP markers across 381 individuals. And what we're seeing here is just how these individuals cluster together on a broader scale. So again, we're seeing those large um, distinct lineages appearing in this, in this graph here, um, reminiscent of our M, our A, our O, and our C lineages. And then here is an admixture plot where each of these lines is representative of an individual B. And it shows us how um, they cluster together based on their ancestry, but also um, the amount of admixture that's occurring in these um, individuals. So we see our broad four clusters, but then again, there's this really highly advanced group right here, um, which I want to draw your attention to, um, which is representative Apis mellifera intermissa, which is a subspecies located in Northwest Africa. And when they did their phylogeographic reconstruction of these bees, the root of the tree, which is represented by Apis serrana, was placed right in the middle of Africa. So it divided our A uh, lineage clade into about into two groups. So we had our intermissa inter individuals, which are highly admixed, as I mentioned on the last slide, and the rest of our African individuals. Uh, we then see that our M group um, groups independently, and then we have our C and our O group sharing a more recent common ancestor. But based on this uh, topology, <clears throat> the overall conclusion was that the origins of Avis Loser must have been in Africa, considering our root is placed right in the middle of Africa. And this is sort of what we've been basing a lot of our research on since then, was that this, you know, this really big paper coming out saying, well, the origins must have been in Africa. A couple of years later, Han and all reevaluated um, the data based on Whitfield and all, but they excluded that intermissa group or that really highly admixed group and actually resolved two different topologies uh, different from what we saw in Whitfield and all. So the first showed that our outgroup um, so they say is placed within our M lineage, uh, or at least closest to the M lineage, but we can really see that it's splitting the A, the O, and the C group sort of to one clade, and then our A group, or sorry, M group into another. <laughs> well, this topology over here places our O group sort of right in the center of these two groups, so our A and our M together, and then our O and our C together. So it, it wasn't supporting this out of Africa hypothesis, so they're more suggesting that, you know, we kind of don't really know what's going on at this point and kind of need, um, you know, some more data and some more um, uh, information. And then 2014, almost 10 years after uh, Whitfield's initial publication, this, we had this publication from Wahlberg, uh, which was the, our largest population genomic data set today. And it, 
surveyed 140 genomic or honeybee genomes over 10 different species using just over 8.3 million SNPs. And their phylogenetic reconstruction placed their outgroup, Apis serrana, or the root of the tree, um, between sort of these two main groups. So our M, C, and our O group, and then our A group. And then based on this topology, they hypothesized that the most parasmonious um, origin for Apis mellifera was probably going to be in Asia, given that all extant species are found there. And given that we're not seeing the root of the tree placed directly in Africa, like we saw with Whitfield. And then our most recent sort of look or trying to you know, get it again, this question of where the honeybee come from came from Crinlin et al in 2017. And they looked at 155 honeybee genomes across five different lineages. So if you've noticed the previous um, publications have all worked off only four different lineages. And this one has uh, data on our fifth, our most recent discovery um, across 18 different populations and looking at just over 100,000 SNPs. So they were able to resolve these five different groups. So Western Europe, Eastern Europe, Africa, and then two groups within West Asia. And their phylogeographic reconstructions were done using a software called TreeMix, which uses allele frequencies to look at the clustering of individuals and um, splits between populations. And they resolved sort of two different hypotheses depending on the inclusion of different samples. But this one here saw a grouping of our A and our Y lineages together. And then again, a grouping of our M, C, and O, which seems to be sort of a consistent occurrence. Um, but on the other hand, we see that in this grouping here, there's sort of a split between our Y and our A group, and then our clustering of our M and our C groups here. So based on these sort of topologies, they resolve that the A and the Y lineage was likely the most earliest branching lineages of these phylogenies, suggesting that the evolutionary origins may have been somewhere in North Africa or potentially somewhere in Western Asia. So again, not quite sure about if this is an African or an Asian um, evolutionary origin. But based on the hypotheses we have so far, we can give some idea or we have some ideas to how their colonization could have occurred based on the different um, ancestral origins we've hypothesized so far. So the first being our out of Africa hypothesis. If the origin of the species is indeed in Africa, they suggest that there could have been two to three different colonization routes to its current distribution. One being, oops. Oh. <clears throat> One being, oh my gosh. <laughs> this happening, okay. So one being through Africa, uh, through the Iberian Peninsula into Western Europe, um, the other going uh, through Northeastern Africa into the Middle East and then into uh, Eastern Europe. Based on a out of Asia hypothesis, it's hypothesized that there again could have been um, three or, or so different colonization routes, um, one going into Africa, and then one following through Africa into Western Europe, and then a separate colonization route into Eastern Europe. The other hypothesis is that uh, Western Europe was not colonized from Africa, but instead was colonized through um, an independent route um, through Europe into Western Europe. And again, it's good to note that this colonization of Western and Eastern Europe is always happening to, from two separate colonization routes and ever together and then splitting into one. But there's still some outstanding questions that we kind of just don't know yet, is we don't have a definitive answer about if the ancestral origins of honeybees, or at least maybe smolifera is in Africa or Asia. And we're still sort of unsure about the colonization of Western Europe, whether it comes um, out of Africa into Western Asia or a separate colonization route through um, the rest of Europe. And that's what we try to achieve uh, with this study. So in order to do this, we worked with a large um, collaborative network who was able to very kindly provide us with samples, um, either whole bees or DNA samples from subspecies throughout the native distribution of Apis mellifera. In total, we had 265 individuals of which we did genome sequencing for, and 92 samples came from previous studies of um, these individuals doing you know, super great work in the field. <laughs> We really wanted to focus uh, new sampling on 
regions within Africa and within Western Asia, considering these are two of the hypothesized ancestral origins, we really wanted to have really good representation here. So we had approximately eight different subspecies from Africa and five different subspecies throughout uh, Western Asia. But before we can get started, we wanted to take a closer look to see how these individuals cluster together into groups, as well as identify any large amounts of admixture that may be appearing in these samples. So at the top here, we have an admixture plot. So each one of these bars represents an individual B, and then the proportion of colors represents the proportion of ancestry of that particular group. Um, down here, we have a PCA, which shows just how those individuals um, cluster together based on their genetic differences. So what we found was that most of our individuals cluster into our previously recognized lineages. So our A lineage found in Africa, our C and our M lineage found in Europe, and our O and our Y lineages found in Western Asia. But we also discovered two uh, genetic clusters not previously identified, which we've sort of named the L lineage, uh, representative of samples from Abus mulliferella marcii in Egypt, and the U lineage, which is represented of Abus mulliferella unicolor from the island of Madagascar. We also note there, there some of our bees do have high amounts of admixture. So uh, these individuals here are Apis mellifera intermissa, so the same admixed bees we saw in, in Whitfield and all, um, which are highly admixed with African as well as our uh, M lineage um, genetics. And that kind, of, that kind of makes sense given the geographic proximity and that these samples are collected in um, Northwestern Africa. So we kind of use these seven um, clusters to sort of base the rest of our analyses from. So we did several phylogeographic reconstructions with our samples. Uh, the first one here was composed using um, SNP variants throughout the entire genome of our samples. Um, our outgroup was Apis serrana, indicated by this black line here. And we resolved um, essentially two main clades with this phylogeny. So the first being our grouping of our M, C, and O, which we've seen consistently uh, throughout some of our other or previously um, developed phylogenies. Uh, we note that the C and the O lineage share a more recent common ancestor within this group. We also see groupings of our Y, our L, our U, and our A lineage together, and note that the U lineage is grouped within our um, African lineages. And what's interesting to note about this phylogeny is that we're finding that our uh, West Asian um, lineages, so the O lineages and the Y lineage, are resolved into separate clades, suggesting that there may have been some split um, that occurred within Western Asia. Our second topology we resolved uh, with just using SNPs located only within protein coding regions. So instead of looking at the entire genome, we're looking just at um, within genes themselves. And again, we resolve this clade with our MC and our O lineage and a more recent common ancestor between C and O. But this uh, topology differs with the placement of our Y lineage. So it isn't grouping with the rest of our African um, lineages here, but it's actually being um, resolved as an earlier branch to both of these clades. So given that we're consistently seeing the separation between O and Y and different placements of the Y lineage, <coughs> suggests to us that um, an Asian um, ancestral origin is probably more likely relative to our African ancestral origin. And to kind of solidify this a little bit more, we did a biogeographic reconstruction applied to both our phylogenies using biogeo bears. And if you look at the node, so this is the uh, topology using um, genes throughout the entire genome. And if we look at the node that splits both of these clades, um, we see that, so this uh, yellow portion indicates um, the probability of it being in an, uh, being an Asian origin. Um, and that probability is about 65%. So there's a 65% probability that the most likely ancestral range was within um, Asia somewhere. And then that continues on throughout the clades themselves. So, um, most likely an ancestral or an Asian origin uh, before a split between Yemenitica, uh, which is in Western Asia and the rest of our African subspe subspecies or lineages. And then again, before we split off um, between our C and our, our O groups. 
um, which are located within Europe and Asia themselves. <clears throat> In our second phylogeny, which was constructed using SIMS within uh, protein coding regions, again, we applied a biogeographic reconstruction and find that the node that splits um, our Y lineage from the rest of our Bs um, provides a, I think it's a 71% probability of being um, an Asian ancestral range relative to an African or European. So I think, you know, it shows like pretty definitively based on our, uh, Oh, I thought about this. Our um, uh, phylogeographic reconstructions, as well as our biogeographic reconstructions, that we're seeing signs pointing to an, an Asian origin rather than an African origin. And some recent work by G in 2021 um, did a biogeographic reconstruction applied to the entire genus and found that um, the node that splits mellifera from other cavity nesting bees, all of other, all of which are found in Asia suggests that the likely ancestral range um, of this group was again likely uh, to be in South uh, East Asia, suggesting that as Apis mellifera moved to its current distribution, it makes more sense that it would have probably expanded and diversified from Western Asia rather than going into Africa first and then expanding out from there. So in summary, uh, we see that the ancestral geographic range was likely somewhere in Asia, potentially within Western Asia. And we see that there is a sort of divide between our, our Y and, or sorry, our O and our Y lineage within our phylogenies. And then to sort of um, speculate on what these colonization routes may have been, uh, we think that it makes most sense that um, Western Europe would have been colonized through a separate colonization route through Europe instead of going through. Um, Africa first, considering our M group clusters uh, most often or always with our C and our, our O lineages. It's likely that the uh, that Eastern Europe was colonized from a separate route and that Europe, or sorry, Africa was probably colonized by two separate routes. So one going um, into sort of Southern Africa and then one into Northern Africa. And we think that based on the fact that um, our L lineage and our Y lineage actually have different uh, mitochondrial origins, suggesting it may have been two separate introductions. All right, so, so far we've sort of, well, we've addressed our first question of where did the honeybee come from and how did it get to its current distribution? Um, but we're also then interested on, you know, what, if, what are the genetic changes that have occurred um, that have allowed the species to occupy such geographically diverse space. And that's what the second part of this talk is going to focus on. So I showed at the beginning of the talk that each of these subspecies um, have very obvious morphological differences, um, but there are also very obvious behavioral differences between each of these groups as well, especially if we look at the differences between temperate and tropically adapted bees. So tropically adapted bees um, tend to swarm and abscond a lot more. So they swarm about four times a year um, compared to temporarily adapted bees, which is about one time of year. Um, these populations in Africa tend to um, be much larger in size. They collect a lot more pollen. Um, they're not collecting as much honey because they're not overwintering like a temperately adapted bee. They're also uh, maybe famous for their um, high aggression. Um, and they also show signs of being more tolerant to disease and pathogens relative to their temporally adapted counterparts. So there are these very stark differences that occur in behaviors um, geographically um, within each of our lineages and between the subspecies in general. So one of our research objectives was to use um, signatures of positive selection doing these scans across the genome to try to target or to try to identify regions of the genome uh, that may be associated with the adaptive radiation of the species. And what we hypothesize is that if we find signatures of positive selection throughout the genome, we hypothesize that these are going to be rich within functional parts of the genome. So either within protein coding regions or maybe within regulatory regions that'll help with those, um, maybe link to those morphological and behavioral changes. We also hypothesize that genes under selection were most likely going to be related to morphology and behavior, given that those are the most obvious differences between each of our lineages and between our subspecies. And then we also hypothesize that genes under selections may be enriched for the worker for worker traits, 
And we've seen this trend before um, that uh, the worker phenotype tends to um, be disproportionately associated with the adaptation of the species. So we, we suspect that we might be seeing that here as well. Okay, so in order to actually detect positive selection across the genome, so positive selection is considered the primary mechanism of adaptation. And in order to do this, we looked for differences in allele frequency between our lineages. So the theory behind this is that if there's a mutation within a population that gives it some kind of fitness benefit, over time, it's going to increase in frequency. And it may increase in frequency such that it actually reaches fixation or it's the only variant at that one spot in the genome. And if we compare two different populations, or in this case, two different lineages, if we compare one population that has that mutation that's beneficial and one population that doesn't have that mutation or potentially that mutation doesn't benefit it in, that, in its environment, we should see really stark allele frequency differences between those populations relative, for example, um, a location in the genome um, that isn't under selection. So the idea behind here is that if we do selection scans that we're going to be targeting or at least identifying locations with high differentiation that correlate with positive selection or signals of positive selection. So in order to do this, we looked at each of our seven uh, genetically distinct lineages, and we did measures of FST between each of our lineages. So we did this in a pairwise fashion. And what FST does is it looks for those highly differentiated sites. So we did um, pairwise FST measures between each of our lineages. So in this case, I'm just showing an example of if this was our M lineage B, you'd be comparing it to our A lineage samples, our L lineage samples, our Y lineage samples, et cetera, until we got measures of FST across the entire genome. And what we're really trying to look for here is measures of FST that are in the top 95th percentile, or what we call the outlier region of that distribution. And we're looking for outliers that are consistently within the top 95th percentile of each of these pairwise, um, pairwise comparisons such that we're identifying lineage specific outliers or, or variants that are at high frequency within our one target lineage, but at our lower frequency or absent within the other lineages. And this is referred to as an outlier uh, based method for detecting selection. So here we see a breakdown of how those outlier SNPs or how many outlier SNPs are found in each of our groups and the number of genes they're associated with. So as a reminder, each of these outlier SNPs are um, individual for each of our lineages. So they don't overlap between any of our lineages. You also notice that uh, we've divided the M lineage into two different groups. So one group composed of subspecies from Europe and one group composed of subspecies from Asia. And you'll also notice that our A lineage, there were very few outlier SNPs detected. Those actually excluded from the rest of the analysis presented. And I'm gonna present um, next. So one of our main questions was, okay, now that we've sort of identified these outliers, where are they actually located within the genome? And more importantly, are they um, enriched within regions that may be of functional importance? So for example, within the gene itself, maybe located within protein coding regions, or maybe upstream of the gene within a regulatory region. So by breaking um, the genome into, into different parts, we looked at how these um, outliers were enriched within these particular regions. So first we looked at the promoter region, which would be responsible for regulate, gene regulation. Um, uh, um, an up arrow indicates that it was enriched, and then a colored arrow indicates that it was significant. So we noticed that most of our lineages, we find that um, outlier loci are enriched within the promoter region and is significant in most um, cases except for our, our M lineage in Asia. And this on average is about a 20% increase over expected values. We then looked at how our outlier SNPs were distributed throughout exons. And we again noticed that in most cases, or in all cases, we see that there's an enrichment um, within exons and then all except our M lineage and our U lineage show um, that this enrichment was significant. And this on average is about a 26% increase over expected values. And then relative to our intronic regions, we note that there is actually an underrepresentation of outlier SNPs within these regions, which is 
indicated by, which is significant in the arrows indicated in red. And on average, we see about a 3% um, decrease uh, relative to expected value. So we are seeing that our outlier SIPs are clustering within regions of functional significance um, rather than something like an intron, which may not be uh, closely related to the function of that gene. We were also interested in what the function of these genes were. So genes associated with outlier SNPs, and we looked at the function of genes using a gene ontology analysis using Drosophila orthologs. And here I'm just showing um, the top 10 gene ontology terms um, that we found associated with genes um, enriched in the M lineage. And we'll see that most of the functions are associated with morphogenesis, um, appendage development, as well as receptor and signaling activity. And if we look across all of our lineages of interest, uh, we see that a lot of these GO terms can be clustered into sort of four main groups. Um, so they're either related to morphogenesis and development, um, receptor and signaling activ activity, learning and memory or behavior. And you know, sort of based on what I've, I presented earlier, it kind of makes sense that these functions be related to things like morphology and behavior, given that there are such stark differences um, between each of our lineages. What's also interesting about genes under selection is we find that they um, significantly overlap between our lineages. So what you're looking at here is the breakdown of genes under selection within each of our lineages. Um, and if they um, overlap with one to six other lineages, or if they may be unique to that particular lineage. But if we look across the entire genome, we notice that there's about 1% um, of genes throughout the entire genome that overlap between each of our evolutionary or genetically distinct lineages. And that corresponds to about 145 genes of interest. We did a deeper dive to see what these genes may be related to. And some of these genes, um, actually overlap with previously published work, especially differentially expressed gene work um, related to uh, varroa response, colony defense, uh, royal jelly, and honey production. So it's sort of suggesting to us that a lot of the genes under selection are shared between a lot of these lineages, and they may be related to things like colony-related colony traits, so a colony response to varroa or colony um, uh, response to uh, defense, which is a pretty interesting finding. And this sort of raises this question about gene use uh, within APIS species. So uh, this paper was published by G et al. in 2012. And they also looked for signatures of selection, looking for genes under selection between um, their different lineages in APIS serrana, which is a sister group to APIS mellifera. And they found 153 uh, genes under selection, but noticed that a lot of these genes were overlapping with their different evolutionary lineages. So if they looked between two groups, they found 17 genes under selection, um, between three groups, uh, seven genes under selection, and each of their uh, five dis uh, uh, genetically distinct groups, they found um, this one gene under selection among all these groups. So it raises this really interesting question about gene reuse um, within APIS, with APIS specifically, and how it may be related to the diversification of the species among very distinct regions. And it'd be really interesting to see if this pattern continues as we take a closer look at our other um, APIS species within the genus. So finally, our last question about selection is that we were interested in if the queen or the worker phenotype had a disproportionate effect on the adaptive radiation of the species. And we did this by looking at differentially expressed genes between the two groups. So in particular, we focused on genes that were upregulated in the queens relative to workers, or genes that were upregulated in workers relative to the queen caste. And we used two different data sets to look at this. So uh, one of our data sets um, was differentially expressed genes in developing larvae. So either larvae developing as into the queen caste or larvae developing into a worker. And we note that there was about 1,100 genes upregulated in queens and almost 2,000 genes upregulated in workers. We also used a protein atlas, which looks at um, proteins expressed in tissues between queens and workers. And note that there were 77 genes upregulated in queens versus 90 uh, genes upregulated in workers. 
So we're really interested in, based on how these genes are segregating in the two casts, do we find um, any of our genes under selection, um, do we find that they're enriched in any of those groups um, of genes? And what we find is that um, genes associated with, or genes under selection associated with the worker cast um, seem to be enriched in both larvae and adult differentially expressed genes um, relative to what we'd expect by chance. So zero would indicate that there's no difference between um, what we find and what we'd expect by chance. But for a worker cast, we see that on average, there's a 95% increase or 95% um, difference relative to what we would expect by chance. But for the queen cast, we actually see that there's a 42% um, decrease. So we're actually seeing underrepresentation of genes under selection within differentially expressed genes of queens. If we look at uh, different, differentially expressed proteins, we see the same sort of trends. So we see this um, enrichment within the worker cast equating to about 180% increase over expected values relative to what we see um, in the queen cast, we're actually seeing underrepresentation of genes uh, within genes um, expressed within the queen cast. So pretty stark and interesting differences. We also check to see whether the proportions of genes under selection on each of these groups was different. So for example, we're testing to see if, um, if we find, you know, this might be like 37% of genes um, within the worker cast is significantly different than the 70% we find in the queen cast. And we find that in each case, the worker cast always has a greater proportion of genes under selection um, based on that differentially expressed gene list. And this is consistent across each of our, of our lineages and across both our larvae differentially expressed genes and our adult differentially expressed genes. So in summary, for the second part of the paper and the second part of this presentation, we've been able to show that outlier SNPs or those potentially associated with positive selection are enriched among protein coding genes as well as the promoter regions. And this suggests that protein coding regions and, gene, and regions under gene regulation um, may be hot spots for selection. And that's what may be driving um, the difference in adaptation we see between diff these different lineages. We also note that the function of genes under selection are related to morphology and behavior, which suggests, and we also note that there's a lot of overlap between these genes, which suggests that many of the same genes or gene functions may be related to the adaptation of these lineages. Um, and then finally, we note that genes are enriched among differentially expressed genes and proteins among the worker cast, which suggests that the worker phenotype or maybe things related to the colony phenotype has a disproportionate role in adaptation relative to the queen, uh, queen phenotype. And then with that, I would just like to thank everyone who was involved with the paper, especially those who were able to contribute um, samples. I definitely would not have been able to do that without them. Um, thanks to the Zyad Lab as well, as well as funding partners. And I hope you guys really enjoyed the talk um, and found it as interesting as I did. All right, thank you so much, uh, Katie. Uh, I'll uh, MC the Q&A period. So if you have any question on uh, Katie's talk, I think there is, a, well, there is a Q&A box. You could type your question in there and uh, Katie will uh, answer it live. Uh, can I, uh, there we go there, so you could see me. All right, so we have a couple of questions already. So uh, Daniela asks, how many subspecies exist in other, how many subspecies exist in other apis species in Asia? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I do not know. <laughs> um, I don't work a lot with the other apis species, so I'm not quite sure about how they sort of delineate into their own groups. Um, I know that paper I referenced by G um, recently looked at how apis serrana differentiated into distinct um, sort of geographical as well as ecological um, space, um, but I'm not quite sure about, about the other ones. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, what made the bees establish more strongly in Africa if they migrated from elsewhere? Uh, this is Wanja. Established more strongly in Africa. 
Um, that's an interesting question. So we see that um, the subspecies in Africa or the, the, the group in Africa is much more um, diverse, I guess you would say. There's a lot more subspecies than our African lineages relative to um, our temporally adapted lineages. Um, and what we think sort of happened here was that during the last glacial period, there was a big expansion within this group um, relative to temporally adaptive bees who would have had, would have probably seen a contraction in their, in their population numbers. So they expanded to very large sizes and we see that reflected in their demography. We see very large effective population sizes for this lineage. And that probably gave them a chance to sort of diversify and expand into all these you know, different um, subspecies. Um, I think that also is probably reflective of their behaviors as well. They swarm much more frequently than temporally adaptive bees, um, which is allowing them to establish many more colonies, um, again, increasing their um, effective population size and just making that group so much larger than everyone else. Um, I, think, I think that's really what's contributed to maybe being more strongly established within that region and being so much larger than what we're seeing in some of these other lineages. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next question is from Dova. I'm curious why the Y lineage wasn't considered in many of the earlier studies you mentioned before 2017. Um, we didn't know it existed. <laughs> uh, so we, it was recently found. So um, Harper et al. in 2016, <laughs> um, they did some sampling uh, throughout Western um, Asia and noticed that this group was actually different from um, other subspecies in Western Asia. And that was actually our first, um, first finding of this group. So it was only um, included in 2007 onwards because we actually didn't know of its existence prior to that. So it's so, it's so interesting to see how like this group is always changing, how we're always discovering new species or, or new, sub, sub, su new subspecies or new lineages um, just because we kind of miss them in our previous sampling. So it's very interesting. Yeah. Maybe I'll add to that. We know that the subspecies existed. There's just the, the Y lineage and whether it was really distinct from the O group that was kind of unclear and, until we sequenced them and, and they were really different from all. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you, Dofa. Next question is uh, from uh, Professor Margarita uh, Lopez Urbe. Uh, did you okay. date the phylogenies and when did these diversification events take place? Thank you, Margarita. We did. Um... So in our study here, maybe I'll bring up the, the slide. Okay, oh, oops. All right, so um, with our biogeographic reconstructions, we also did divergence dating. Um, it's a little cut off here, um, but we used PAML to do the divergence datings and use the uh, split between Apis serrana and um, Apis mellifera as uh, sort of to root the dating of the tree. And we find, based on the way we've done this analysis, a pretty uh, old or early divergence of about 6 million years. Um, however, I kind of, I also want to emphasize that, um, there's been a lot of different divergence estimates with Apis mellifera, and we kind of have a very large range of divergence dating. So here we're suggesting a pretty, um, early divergence between each of the subspecies. But if you look at work using mitochondrial DNA, um, you know, that divergence is hypothesized to start about a million to 2 million years ago. Um, and then there's even more, um, there's a, a divergent state by Wahlberg who used discordant analysis. And, you know, he found that, you know, those, these divergences could have occurred anywhere from 300,000 um, years ago or even sooner. So you kind of have a, this really broad range. And I, I, I'm, I'm honestly not quite sure what the correct dating may be, um, given that we do see such diversification. So I think we have kind of a range that we can work with to maybe kind of narrow down what may be the best um, or, or more accurate divergence state. Um, so hopefully, that's, hopefully that answers your question, but you know, it gives you a little background on how we've kind of, we don't really have a great grasp on that yet, I don't think. <laughs> 
Uh, thank you. And then I think uh, uh, Professor Lawrence Packer uh, wanted to follow up. So I'm going to ask you to unmute uh, Lawrence. Yeah, thanks, Emro. And that's a great talk. Okay. Oh. Congratulations. Fabulous thank stuff. Um, I'm wondering, so the timing of these dispersal events, um, are, it, you mentioned somebody saying something about glaciation. Um, so what I mean, what have, what paleo environmental uh, events might have l lined up with some of these dispersal events? Mm. This is a good question too, um, and one I'm not entirely sure on. Um, I know if we, you know, considering I know there's some work that's looked at, you know, where the genus sort of has sort of come from, and has tried to place their um, dispersal based on uh, past geographic events. And I know there's some suggestions saying that, um, you know, glaciation throughout Europe would have, or could have forced these bees into Asia, um, which is one hypothesis to how they could have expanded from Asia into their current distribution. Um, there's also a competing hypothesis suggesting um, if it was to support an African, dispersal that during that glaciation that that a uh, group would have come into Africa um, but this is that would have happened oh gosh I think it was 15 15 million years ago or so I'm not quite sure about the dates um, but in terms of recent I'm not again I'm not quite sure about how it lines up with um, geographic events other than um, what we know about um, the last glacial period and how that could have affected um, the demography of tropically versus temporally adapted bees. Again, I think it also comes down to the fact that we potentially don't have a very good understanding of those divergent states in general to be able to line them up um, with exact um, geographic and uh, yeah, historical geographic events. Okay, th thank you. Um... One, one thing I'm going to say, we've got an international audience here. So are there honeybees, are there countries you need honeybees to add to your samples? Mm. This is a great time to ask people. Um, it looked to me like you need some from Kazakhstan. I don't know if there's anybody from Kazakhstan in the, in the audience, but, you know, let me, let us know where you need them from. Then we can start trying to get them. True. Okay. Yeah, definitely. I think expanding our collections from Western Asia would be a great idea, um, especially getting closer into um, like Central Asia. We know we've, we've started seeing some subspecies uh, crop pop up there. So, for example, we found one in China. Um, I also present one here from Kyrgyzstan, um, but we it is very sparse in that area. So sampling. Um, even like, even to just like check, because we don't know if there's, there's bees in these areas. So some of these bees are, are, are new and we've only found them recently. So even just sampling more within Central Asia and potentially within um, Southwestern Asia, um, what it would be a good idea as well. Um, if, you know, just by chance you may find something we've missed. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh all right. Uh, any other questions? I'm uh, monitoring the Q&A. Uh, again, if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A because uh, if you type them in the chat, then copy and paste or, or type them again in the Q&A so we uh, don't miss anything. Uh, maybe while, while we're waiting, Katie, Katie, what's next? Have, have, have you answered all of the unsolved mysteries? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> that's a broad question. So yeah. you can interpret it as you see fit. <laughs> yeah, I think like, you know, I think we did a really nice job with this paper. Um, but like I've mentioned, like, you know, things we've, we, we're still discovering new subspecies and we're still finding, um, you know, that bees are, are grouping into these larger, broad lineages um, differently than we thought they were. And I think you know, over time, we're probably going to find new samples, um, which are going to bring about new questions. And I think this is probably just one piece of a bigger puzzle we kind of still have to have to finish. But I think this least gives us a better idea um, trying to resolve that Africa versus, versus Asia de debate we've been having. <laughs> And then, okay, maybe maybe a follow up, and 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 it's it's something that has kind of uh, 
you know, we, we, we have subspecies and, and we have groups and, and some groups have multiple subspecies. And, and then I, I think with uh, your paper, you, you discover two new groups that are essentially just mono subspecies, if, if that's a, <laughs> if that's the thing. So our, yeah. our, is the A as, uh, sorry, the L and, and the U groups really like groups like A, O, C, and M, or, I mean, yeah, what, what do we do with what do we do with these kind of just unique groups yeah. that are represented by a, a, just a one subspecies? I mean, they seem to be distinct groups. I mean, they have, you know, if we look at morphology, they're distinct. If we look at gene- like their nuclear as well as mitochondrial variation, you know, they seem to be pretty distinct and can stand alone on their by themselves. So I guess like what would be interesting is again, maybe while they're only represented by one subspecies now, you know, who is to say if we keep, if we poke around a little bit more, we, we're, we're not going to find species with, um, you know, morphological differences and that we can categorize as a new subspecies. Um, you know, we find so many in, in Africa that differ, you know, slightly by different morphological features, what we see, like, you know, based on genetics, you know, they're very similar, um, you know, same thing within, you know, the, oh, the, the C and the M lineage, we were finding these groups of distinct bees um, that just happen to share, be, be more closely related based on genetics rather than, rather than morphology. So, you know, who's to say if we sample a bit more, we won't find more bees within those groups. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> fair, fair, fair points. Uh, I'm going to ask Lawrence to unmute again. I, he has another question. Uh... Yeah, so thanks. Um, you mentioned kind of in passing effective population sizes being larger in Africa than some of the other places. Can you say something about how large the effective population sizes are from different places and also how that might um, match up with effective population sizes of other bees? Mm, Of other bees. Um, Okay, so in Africa, um, so based off of the work I did as well as um, the work Wahlberg did, so it kind of matches up, um, we kind of as hypothesized that the effective population size about 600,000 um, relative to um, our temporally adapted it ranges between somewhere between 100 and 200,000. 200, so it's about anywhere from six to three times the size um, relative to these temperate regions. Um, In terms of other bee species, I mean, Apis has, Apis milfer has such a huge geographic range and there's just so many individuals. I'm not, I don't know how it would would compare to other bees. Um, Maybe on a similar scale, like for example, Apis serrana I know is, has a very large population um, they also uh, swarm quite frequently as well. Um, I guess if we we could hypothesize that they'd probably be probably similar sizes to what we're probably seeing in Africa, I would assume just given based on the behavior and, and the way we that population is distributed. Um, but for smaller populate, populations of bees, I would assume probably a lot smaller. Just you know, just relatively, I'm not, I couldn't give you exact numbers or anything, but relatively probably a lot smaller. Okay, thank you. All right, I I think that's it. So uh, uh, let's uh, give uh, Katie a nice round of applause. Thank you so much, Katie, for the fun presentation. Thanks everybody for attending. Thanks Katie for a great talk Um, as great talks do, you end up with dozens more questions than you started off with. And that's just fabulous. I'm hoping everybody can see this screen. Can you see the advert for the next talk? Somebody let me know. Yeah, Lawrence, we can see it. Okay, so the next talk is uh, June the 29th. All right, same time, a completely different place. The talk will be given from Washington and Israel. Um, and it's going to be on the mining bee family Andrenidae, phylogeny, taxonomy, diversification, and biogeography. So I'm looking forward to that.
And uh, let's see, the one after that in July, that's going to be uh, Eduardo Almeida talking about phylogeny of Kaledids, I believe, if I remember correctly. So thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next talk in a month's time. And bye from me.